the Radio Forest Podcast. Love that picture, man. Oh, thanks, D. Just own it. Let's own that chicken leg, man. Own it. Corn dog. Love them. Oh, even better. <laughs> even better. My apologies to the corn dog. Oh my God. I can't go to a fair or a carnival and not buy a corn dog. And then they get like foot long ones and they get crazy. But I'm always a sucker for a good corn dog. You know, my thing is the uh, funnel cake. I mean, you know, and I've, I've always tried to eat healthy and stuff. It's just out the window at any carnival or fair. And uh, cook it a little longer. I like it crunchy. Sugar on that, please. <laughs> you mentioned a turkey leg. It always sounds like a better idea than it is because about <laughs> halfway through it, I'm like, I'm getting sick and this is way, this is way too much. Uh, yeah, so Mitch, uh, Mitch, what's his name, said about pancakes. They seem like a great idea at the beginning, but halfway through, you're sick of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Well, D. Snyder, welcome, man. We're here to talk about Legacy, a tribute to Leslie West. I just want to give you props because theme for an imaginary West the song that you're on with Mike Portnoy. I didn't know you could sing like that, but I bet you hear that a lot because you can do opera, you can do rock, you can do melodic, you can do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I've done work on bro- shows on Broadway. And, um, you know, after the show, you go to the, always go to the stage door and you sign autographs, that's a thing, you know, which is nice. And every night people would walk up and go, I didn't know you could sing. And I'm like, what do you think? What a, well, like, is, that's like the weirdest backhanded compliment. And they're like, well, well, no, it's Twisted Sister. You're like, that's they expect you to do me to do that. But if I break the mold and I and I do a thing with opera, I'm not an opera. I don't sing. Uh, by the way, people, in a show I did called Rocktopia, I did some opera. It was a mashup of classical and and rock. And I just shocked the audience. We get a standing ovation when I would join the opera singers and start singing opera, and people would just go nuts. But I was at the Tell a Family Secret. I'm a classically trained countertenor, so yeah. I am capable. This tribute to Leslie West and Mountain, you've did two songs. You've got Theme for Imaginary West, Climbing with George Lynch. Now, both of those are off the debut album, and I know that you're a metalhead at your core, so you probably had that debut Mountain the day it came out. Yeah, well, Leslie was a, you know, uh, I was a huge fan. He's my favorite guitar player. Uh, he's actually one of my uh, favorite vocalists, too, which, you know, you wouldn't think about. But I, it's funny, I, I was doing a show with uh, Billy Gibbons a few weeks ago, and I said, hey, were you a fan of Leslie West? He said, absolutely. He goes, but his voice, man, his voice. And, and I said, yeah, he was this fat Jewish kid from Long Island. He sang like an old black man from the Deep South. Mississippi Queen! Yeah, like, like what did he, what, how did he suffer in Forest Hills, Long Island? I don't know. But, uh, you know, it's not a, the thing is, I'm, I'm honored to be on this record. It's about the guitar players. And, and you know, and I know that Leslie West is reduced to one song, and which often happens with a career. And, you know, if you have one, you're lucky. But everybody, like, you go, Mississippi Queen, they go, oh, yeah, cool. That's a great song. I love that. But they don't know how far reaching his playing was and how, he, how many people he affected. And before I get into this, this, this who's who on this record who, of guitar players, did you know that Leslie's been sampled on over 100 hip uh, rap songs? I did. I actually talked to Leslie, and uh, he was going through some of the records on his wall. He's like, Kanye West and so-and-so and such-and-such. And such. He said he would get a check in the mail, and he's like, I didn't do that song. What is this? And his <laughs> manager, whoever, would be like, oh, they're gonna, they sampled it, the drum beat and this and the drum beat and that. And so he thought it was really cool. Yeah, of course he did. He bought him his house. Uh, <laughs> 99 Problems, that from Jay-Z, that's one there. People, I'm talking, you know this already, so I'm joining you. I'm the co-host today. Listen to this who's who of guitar players who play on this tribute record. Zach Wild, Marty Freeman from Megadeth, Eddie Ojeda from Twisted Sister, Martin Barr from Jethro Tull, Steve Morse from Little Feet and Deep Purple, Elliot Easton from The Cars, George Lynch from Dokken, Robbie Krieger from The, the Doors. Doors, Randy Bachman, Ingve Malmsteen, Slash. And by the way, this was not a pay. Nobody got paid here. This was all, all for the love of Leslie West and, and appreciation of what he did. That is an inc- I, I was stunned to see some of the people on this. I'm like, Elliot Easton? How did he affect Elliot Easton from the cars? Well, apparently he did. It's just incredible lineup of guitar players. And, and there's some good singers on here, but we're really just icing on the cake. It's like, it's all about the guitars. Did, did uh, Leslie West, did he visually inspire you at all? Because I also talked to drummer Corky from Mountain and he told me, he said, Forrest, 
Leslie was wearing lipstick, high heels, blouses before anybody, before anybody else was doing that. He said that Leslie was a freak since day one. Did that style carry over into the 80s, Twisted Sister, or was it like the Alice Cooper, the David Bowie's kind of all mixed together? Yeah, it's, it's more of the latter, you know, New York Dolls. I mean, Leslie was a freak. Uh, he, was, he wasn't afraid to get out there, and, and he was very obese, like less so in his later years where he, he really lost a lot of weight. But he was, the mountain name came from his solo, first solo album was called Mountain because they were describing him. He would stand out there. He played the littlest guitar in the world, a Les Paul Jr. The biggest guitar player in the world played the littlest guitar. And yeah, he was not afraid to wear bright colors and blousy things and crazy things. But I remember standing in front of a mirror, say, trying to make myself look fatter, imitate and, and, and lip syncing <laughs> and, and lip syncing, skinny kid. <laughs> lip syncing, you know, Mississippi Queen and saying, if I, if I turn this way, I'm a little bit thicker and I look more like Leslie. Now, what was it like to see them live? Did you see them early in, in their career? No, I was one of those guys who had the strict uh, cop dad, a, uh, a Sunday school teacher mom, and uh, they fought the tide for a very long time. Hence my career and how effed up I was. And, you know, so you wonder why I looked the way I looked and sang what I sang. That's why. Church lady and, and, and uh, you know, and the, and the vet cop were raising the kid the hard way. But I love them. And, they, you know, and I actually, actually thanked them for being so tough on me because it made me who I am. But this said, yeah, I, I didn't get to see many concerts in those days. But Leslie was his hero. I remember the day that Eddie Ojeda brought him down to a Twisted concert, Radio City Music Hall. I remember for two reasons. One, because a legend walked in. Uh, and, and said how much he enjoyed what I did, too, because he plugged in. He pl proceeded to plug his guitar in and blew up Eddie's amplifiers an hour before showtime. And, uh, and the panic as roadies were running all over Manhattan trying to get new amps because Leslie melted ours because uh, he, he he's that kind of guitar player. What was it like, though, seeing Queen live? I know you saw them before they were like this huge, massive thing that we know today because you were a Queen fan from the old school. What were they like in the beginning? Oh, yeah, I'm like, I'm like the day one Queen fan when there was no Queen fans. And I went to see them opening for Mott the Hoople. It was their first U.S. Oh, tour. Wow. And they played the Eurus Theater. And when they were on stage, and this is a fact, I was the only person in the entire theater standing up. And not just standing up, screaming my head off. <laughs> I was embarrassing my friends. I was screaming. There's one thing, one thing worse than no reaction from a crowd. One guy. <laughs> one freaky, weird, skinny, big guy with an afro out there <laughs> losing his excrement. At one point, this is true, Brian May looked up to the balcony <laughs> to see what the commotion was because it was just like, ah, ah, I'm like losing it. And they were incredible. There were recordings of them playing and they were just people, but people didn't get them yet. They were yet to, to reach people's you know, psyche at that point. They were like, Who's these guys? And what's, yeah. up, what's up with that? What's up with that half of a mic stand that guy's prancing around with up there? What happened there? You forget the rest of it? You've got radio shows. You've done radio in the past. You've got your own coffee brand. You've got two new albums with Josta, TV shows and movies. And you talked about Broadway. Does that have anything to do with, I heard an incredible story about you that the 90s hit. The phone calls aren't coming in. Grunge is ruling. You went back to work at an office job and were riding your bike and people would be like, hey, are you D. Snyder? And you were so struck by that. You're like, no, 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 that's not me. How did you come back into the fold? And did that make a big impact on what you do today and why you do so much stuff? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, everything you said is true. And, and yeah, it was, it was, I was embarrassed that people were recognizing me working a desk job, but I was broke. Uh, I had three children and, you know, I wasn't about to pack it in, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, and I had to whatever you could do to pay the bills. And that's where it started. I restarted. And, uh, and yeah, it was it was really tough. I, there was an article in a business magazine about branding. And they chose me as the example of a person who had branded himself really well. And I'm reading the article going, wow, this is very impressive. If only it was true. Because they had it like <laughs> it was a big plan. It was just pure desperation. I was just say yes to anything. They, hey, you got a good voice, you know. Uh, you could do a voiceover. And I started going to auditions until I made a voiceover career. People thought I could be good on radio. And, you know, you don't just jump in, as you know, into a career. And I was doing a 
Sunday night, midnight to 2 a.m. metal show, and, you know, answering the phones, producing the show, doing the ads on Tuesday, doing the whole thing for like three bucks an hour. You know, so it was all just desperation and just taking any opportunity I can. And then they turned into, uh, you know, and, 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 and writing, I started writing movies. And I've got a kids TV show in development over uh, animated show over at uh, Peacock right now. Got a, uh, a stop motion animation, a special that's coming together over at Stupid Buddies right now. So I'm, I'm doing so many different things, but it really came down to desperation. You were involved in the very first Earth Day, but I know you're also a huge motorcycle and car guy. So has owning an electric car changed your view on that American muscle and fuel burning engines and, and that kind of uh, muscle? I am definitely, yeah, that's true. Boy, you, you know your facts. Yeah, I actually was part of the first Earth Day. I, I am a big conservationist, but to a limit. I'm, I'm like this moderate guy, so I've got a Tesla S. And I sold my uh, Viper, I sold my Hemi Challenger because it just blew the doors off them. But my other car is an H2 Hummer, which I have tricked out for the apocalypse. And each car has its own bumper sticker. One on the Tesla says, my other car is a Hummer. And on the Hummer says, my other car is a Tesla. It just confuses <laughs> the hell out of everybody. But I've always been that guy. You know, yeah. that's, that's just me. That defines me as a person. Vice Magazine called me a gun-toting feminist. People don't understand me. They go, how can you be Second Amendment guy, then be pro-choice? You know, like, well, why are they mutually exclusive? How can you be so against censorship, but then fight against people who won't wear their masks? That's, that's their sensory. And I go, I go, they're not, we don't have to be full left, full right. And most of us aren't, man. Most of us aren't. It's like 60% of us or more are just kind of figuring it out. And we're a little bit over here. We're a little bit over there because because that's the smart way to be. You got to make mm -hmm. make the right decisions for yourself, you know. So I've always just been that guy. Now I know you uh, were a pastor for a while. Are you still a pastor? Because I know I think you did Twiggy Ramirez's wedding from Marilyn Manson in a perfect circle. Did you do any other high profile weddings? And are you still available for people to book you, or is that kind of something that's passed? I've done celebrity weddings. I've done family weddings. I've done. Uh, I've been hired to do weddings. Recently, I was just down in Florida. I mean, this is like two weeks ago. I, w I was an emergency pastor. That was my niece's wedding. And she called my, it's my wife's niece, really. Uh, and called my wife up in tears because her, she said, oh, our guy canceled. He got sick into the hospital. I don't know what we're going to do. And, I, and I, 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 I was listening to a speaker. I go, I can do it. What? And Suzette goes, yeah, yeah, your Uncle D's done a lot of these things. <laughs> so, so I was like, to the rescue. I put my cape on and I flew in and I, and I, so I just, I just married somebody the other day. Well, D, it's been an honor. Legacy, a tribute to Leslie West, it's Zach Wilde, Marty Friedman, Robbie Krieger. You got Rudy Sarzo and of course, the legendary D Snyder. The two new albums with Jamie Josta are out now. TV shows and movies and animations and voiceovers. D, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I know, I love it. Oh, the coffee, D. Yeah. Snyder coffee. Uh, he was in Chappelle's show, all kinds of stuff. D, I appreciate the hustle. I love the new stuff with Josta. I really like what I've heard so far from Legacy. So congratulations to you and thanks for taking the time. Hey, thanks, Forrest. Hope to share a corn dog with you one of these days. <laughs> Take there care. Bye-bye. <laughs>